Is that his number? Gabar, mate, he's the guy. Yeah. Three, two, and uno. <laughs> Welcome to the Matty Johns podcast, and I uh, hope you're doing uh, good out there. Uh, plenty of grog, plenty of green lights. Um, <laughs> Kenty, Finchie, how you doing, boys? Good, Matty. Go, now, Kenty, Go in a minute right. we'll get to um, the Nathan Cleary, uh, sorry, the Ivan Cleary interview on 360 last night. Behind the scenes and how it happened, how your day unfold after you wrote a scathing article. A scathing article. Unbelievable. And uh, it got him out. Got him out and about. We'll talk about that. Uh, but Finchy, mate, last week you spent um, spent a few days in North Carolina shooting an ad with Alan Iverson. Yeah, I did, Matty. I was over in uh, Charlotte with uh, do a bit of work with Points Bet, and um, it's a good city. Yeah, it was a nice city. I was only there for about forty eight hours, but mm. um, yeah, shot a commercial with Alan Iverson. The That's great enough. Alan. That's <laughs> that can be enough. It's enough for me to get in trouble, Kenny. Um, good bloke, Alan Iverson. Yeah, he was. It was. Um, yeah, very down to earth. He couldn't really understand what I was saying. I was going to say, that's the best that's strange looks. I was up, I had a few tequilas and we're firing up and he goes, mate, I don't even understand what you're saying, but geez, you're fun to hang out with. <laughs> I, I said, Alan, you haven't seen half I of said, it. I said, I don't know how the commercial is going to turn out, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Interesting, Iverson. Ivan, Iverson is a big name uh, in Australia, but not a household name. Mm. The, the years that he was really dominant in the NBA, I reckon the NBA took a, you know, a, a real dip here in the post Jordan yeah, years, yeah. which LeBron has brought it was them like out early of. early 2000s. Wasn't yeah, it? he was. LeBron's brought, you know, and of course Ben Simmons as well has sort of brought the NBA back to the fore again. Jesus, is powering at the moment in Australia. But um, in those years with Iverson, uh, it wasn't, it sort of disappeared off the radar a little bit. But um, what about, let's have a discussion about that. What are the, let's have some of the names, like in sport, those household names that elevated their sport worldwide. Well, Jordan was the big one. Jordan's a big Tiger Ma- Woods. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and the same thing. Tiger Woods, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Boxing. Yeah. I tell you what, Jonah Lamu. Yeah. Jonah was phenomenal. It's What you're looking for, Matt, is, is the people who the sports fans don't know. Mm. So, and and I remember doing an Olympics once and I wrote about the, the dream team. And I said, this, this ain't a real dream team. They didn't have Bird, Johnson, D- Jordan, that. Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and of you know, 92. All, all 92. the Indians came out of the hill saying, you're a moron. Anyone that knows basketball knows Kevin Durant's a legend. I thought, yeah. well, mate, you're actually making my point because anyone who knows basketball does know. No. But the point is that the, the original dream team when they went to Barcelona – Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, incredible, Patrick Ewing, that, they had, Charles Barkley, they, unbelievable. Yeah, and and that that the, the the ability to transcend your sport that's that's big. There's not a lot of people that can do that. I, I, I question whether I think Cameron Smith is only just beginning to to cut some sway into AFL world where they mm. know him and, mm. and and can do that. So he, he's getting to that stage. Billy Slater was a player who, from a rugby league point of view, was known in the AFL world. Mal did it. Mal, Mal did, did it very it. much. I remember once on uh, the show, El McFoost had that show on the ABC, and uh, she was put. She was an AFL fan, putting rubbish on rugby league, and she took Mal through the streets of Melbourne to prove a point that no one knew rugby league and everyone knew Mal. Uh, <laughs> but interesting about 92, um, 92 Barcelona Olympics yeah. with the green, uh, with the dream, dream team. team. There was a constant war that used to go on between Isaiah Thomas and Michael Jordan. Yeah. It all started because in the first ever All Star game, Isaiah Thomas with Magic Johnson froze Jordan out, mm. and J- Jordan, the sort of guy that held a grudge, little things yeah. like in his life, like being benched as a high school. player, player always stuck with him his whole career mm. where most pe- people would go mate like you know look, <laughs> doesn't matter him, well, well, before what, the Bulls went on their run yeah the, the bad boys the Detroit Pistons they won that's two right two titles in a row I think it was maybe 1991 yes and when they knocked them off to go through I think to the uh the championships, Isaiah Thomas just walked off with yeah, seconds did. left and didn't shake Jordan. what really hurt hurt Isaiah Thomas was Isaiah Thomas was a Chicago local. Yeah. So for him to go to Chicago to Chicago to play the Bulls and be booed mm-hmm. really hit him in the heart. But 92, Isaiah Thomas wasn't part of that team, dream team, because mm-hmm. Jordan said to Chuck Daly, I'm in, but, he's but I'm not in if Isaiah's in. So yeah. make your choice. Yeah. And um, fair to say they made, they made the right one. The top three, top three as far as – Names that elevated their sport. I've gone Muhammad Ali, Tiger Woods, and Pelé. I'm more of a Maradona man, but Pelé, there's no doubt what he did for uh, soccer in America originally was phenomenal. Well, he was part of the original American competition. I think he was with the Comets over there. That's, That's what the, the Cosmos. Cosmos. The New, Cosmos. New York Cosmos. New York Cosmos. Yep. That's them. George Best was at. Uh, he was at maybe at the Florida team. Yeah, he was. Yeah, and Cruyff yeah. was a few other clubs. Yeah, but Pele, Pele was just a name that resonated, mm-hmm. and you, you knew the name Pele before you actually knew what he did. 
That's right, you did. You know what I mean? He was you just, did. Before you knew anything about him, he was just some famous guy, and then he was a famous soccer player, and then you began to... To figure Did he be out the best he... ever soccer player? No, I think no. Maradona. Mm. For me, it's always Maradona. It's a debate, though. Yeah, it is. It's a debate. Um, Maradona, if you look at 86 when he won in Mexico, is that the team around him, you know, when they went into that World Cup, there was no expectation. Even the Argentinian press said they're not going to go any good. Maradona carried him to that victory. Where Pelé played in great Brazil sides. Yeah. You know, Garincha, uh, Socrates, all these. Yeah. Zico, I think. was Oh, no, Zico never won a World Cup. But some really great Brazilian soccer players. Where Maradona, which on Maradona, we like to give people tips. I went and saw the Maradona documentary last night. And I, I put it alongside When We Were Kings as oh, really? I think the greatest sports documentary I've ever seen. I was sitting in the Cremorne Cinema, about 30 other people, and when the closing credits come down, everyone was just sitting there. Everyone just sat and everyone turned around and started talking about the movie. Was it's, it just a, the whole career? Or it's what? a snapshot, yeah. Finchie. It, it's, a, it's, it's like an Italian love story between the city of Naples and Diego Armando Maradona. So you've got to understand Naples, when Napoli bought him, they bought him from Barcelona. He never fitted in Barcelona. He had two seasons there, crippled with illness and had a really bad uh, ankle injury, uh, which a Basque player from Real Sociedad sort of cut him down. And, but he never fitted in. They always thought he's this upstart from the new world. Mm. And, um, but it fit perfectly with the city of Naples. The Na- city of Naples is you know, the poor, it's a very, very poor city. Maradona went there and sort of said, you know, I'm one of you. Uh, they were... They were, too, you know, they were fighting relegation, and within a couple of years of him getting there, they're European champions. And you're just watching, you know, you're watching the whole story of Maradona, and it's, it's, a, and then how it turns bad in the city of Naples, you know, where he eliminates Italy in the uh, 1990 World Cup uh, semi final in a penalty shootout, and the city turned against him. And it's, as I said before, tough mate, situation. I know. <laughs> What's he supposed to do? It's amazing, mate. He went from literally being a religious icon. Diego, between the city of Naples, they're calling him the devil and Satan is in Naples. and It was unbelievable, the, the backlash, but um, very, very interesting. Uh, big day for you yesterday, Kenty. You began with you writing a story about Ivan Cleary that obviously stuck in his craw a little bit. Mm. And um, how did it come about that by, by sundown he's appearing on NRL 360? Yeah, look, <clears throat> there's... Different narratives in the game, Matt. There's the public stuff that's going on that everybody sees and there's stuff that happens behind the scenes. And Ivan doesn't really... We all know he doesn't care much for the media and he's never really shown an interest to, to do much in the media uh, when he's coaching. And that's that's mostly fine. I think when you're copping $2 billion off broadcasters, there comes an obligation to pay it back. But uh, I wrote the column after their performance on the weekend against Canterbury where in all of... If you looked at the stats, you would think they should have won. Penrith won, yeah, because they made ran for more meters. They they made less tackles. They had more possession. They on, did all that on stats. And you said if you hide the scoreline, look at the stats and say Penrith by twenty at least. Yeah, and so anyway, so and we all know that Canterbury just hung on grimly and and, and won the game to, through their defence. So I wrote a story about that, and um, I, I chipped Ivan about it, uh, and it was a it was a pretty solid. To be fair, it was a pretty solid crack. Got him on the way through. Uh, got him. <laughs> I did. And uh, you don't miss too often. No, he, he rang me. He rang me yesterday, and he just said, "Mate, have we got a problem?" I said, "Yes, we have." Mm. And uh, he says, "A personal." I said, "Yes, it is." Mm. And at we then point, banged on for about half an hour. At what point, personal, Kenty? Well, just personal. The fact that I just don't think he respects. You know, it, it, the the fact that I, I take offence when he comes out and says. Uh, last year, there's misinformation out there, and he basically blankets the, the the entire media. There's misinformation out there about him leaving West to go to Penrith. Well, what ultimately happened? Okay, mm. now at the time he may not yeah. have decided in his mind, but certainly it was in his. It was, certainly it was swirling around. Yeah. But to sit there and just basically have a crack at everybody, there's misinformation. I'm not talking about. I just I think it showed a lack of respect, uh, and. Would you care if he didn't talk about it, but it was because he said misinformation? Yeah, I, 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 look, I, nobody's obligated to tell anybody their personal business, Finchie. Mm-hmm. You're not obligated. Mm. But don't don't fire back. Don't sit there and say, mate, I can't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Mm. But don't get aggressive and come back and try and... Yeah, you know, you know those people you have an argument with and you, you know, it, it's, it's often your wife. You, nine out of ten, you're right, but the one out of ten is the one they know you on and they, yeah. they, they just won't let that one go. Yeah, you I know, know what I mean? And, oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm nodding along here. Yeah. Yes, oh, I know. But, Darling, I was just at a karaoke bar, seriously, <laughs> with your youngest Even son. Even a broken clock's right twice a day. Oh. Yeah, but... <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Uh, no, but I just thought that there's, there was better. There were better ways to handle. Back then, he probably should have got better advice. Uh, and anyway, but to f- basically get the machine gun out and say the media is just writing all this stuff that's not mm. true, when it was true, it became true. How was he when he turned up here at Fox? Yeah, so out of that, well, we had a good talk yesterday on the phone and we sorted it all out and we went through things like that. He's, he, he didn't want to come on 360 this year because he said, I, I just don't want to talk to anybody. And I said, but mm. your fans are asking. Come on, we Mark. get letters from us, from yeah. the Penrith people, emails, uh, text messages, all this. Give us a go. We're, we're, how, you blokes hate Penrith, you may get Ivan on. Well, Ivan didn't, didn't want to come on. Mm. Uh, and it was not – we didn't want to ask him anything hard. Like, obviously, that uh, he's had a horrible off-season with the, yeah. the West stuff and then into the, the Penrith yeah. stuff that began the season. But there, there are ways you can still address your fans. There are ways yeah. you can handle it. And, and so, anyway, we just talked about it all through. We had – you know, it, it was personal. Uh, there were some things that, obviously, out of respect to Ivan, uh, he didn't want to talk about. But at the end of it, he said, look, mate, I just – I don't want to fight. I just, you know, and he's not that sort of guy. He's a, no. He is a good man. And yeah, so we got out of it and he just said, look, I'll come on 360. Um, mm. Let me know when. And, and I got into work. There'd been a few other phone calls made around. Um, and we said, well, let's just get him on tonight. So I How rang him up. that when you said, mate, uh, tonight? Do you... No, he, yeah, well, he was okay. And yeah. to be honest, it was better to do it sooner rather than later. Yeah. Deal with it. It's done. And I said to him, I said, mate, I'm not going to set you up here. Tonight's not going to be a... Uh, you know, I'm not going to come guns blazing at you, but uh, you know, the questions will be there. You answer them how you want to answer them. And he said, look, ask me what you like. Um, no subject was off limits. He obviously knew which the types of questions that were coming. Mm. And out of it, I, I, look, I think he did himself a, in many ways a lot of favours last yeah. night because he just he, he, he acted like an adult. When you wrote that article, did you think it was going to play out the way it did? I thought I'd get a phone call. Yeah, I, I was pretty sure I would. Hey, boys, um, retro round this week. I, I love it when we do this on Fox Sports, and the focus is the 70s. Finch, you weren't born in the 70s. No. Nah. Funny, you're, the first grand final I remember watching as a kid, that I remember, was Sydney grand final, was your dad's. Yeah. Him winning uh, St. George over Parramatta. Drawn in 1977, grand drawn grand final and win it on replay. That's the one I remember. Uh, yeah. That's my first, yeah. yeah. He come back on the Tuesday, I think. Tuesday night, yeah. yeah. Come back yeah. Tuesday. Won 22 nil, I think, in the... Yeah, yeah, the replay. What are your memories, Candy, from the 70s? Some of your favourite memories. Oh, look, I, I can I remember a lot being woken up in the 78 Kangaroo Tour. Um, my father would come in and wake me up at two in the morning or whatever it was at the time. Yeah, it was. And, uh, yeah. You know, game's about to start. And I always, I dragged myself out of bed. You know, you're dog tired when you're, I was eight years old. And you'd walk in, you'd walk in, I, I'd always fall asleep in the second half. But I, I remember watching the game then. I remember falling in love with the likes of, of Tommy Rodonigas and, and the West. My mum and dad used to take my, myself and my brother to the, always to the, the West Parramatta games at Lincoln Oval yeah. in the 70s. Uh, and it was a, it was just it was great theatre. It was great what? theatre. You'd sit on the little bike track around Lincoln Oval, and uh, the, the 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 tiger uh, the tiger, the magpies were coming on in the late seventies. Roy Masters took over in seventy eight, and yep. uh, they were the, the, yeah they hated they hated Manly clearly, but Parramatta were a pretty close second. And they used to just get into Ray Price, and Ray Price had this great theatre about him when he'd come on for the Eels, so that you'd be waiting for Parramatta. And everyone would be just wait, and it's almost like he sensed the crowd. He would just burst out of the tunnel, and he, his arms would he'd do this with his arms, yeah, he swing the arms, the windmill, covered in Vaseline, covered in Vaseline, and he just came out like a warrior. Yeah, he, he was like he was just so ready that, for the that battle. Great shot in the, the cricket ground sheds where great is he prices. Close? After the Origin, yeah, yeah, on the stage. What a mate, yeah. what a player. And he was, and and so the, and it just used to be on, and the, the game was rough and tough, and yeah, the great, the, obviously the, the the big one, I reckon the. From the seventies, the one that everyone talks about is the, the Firebros and the Silver Tails, and it's a complete mention of, of Roy Masters. There was as many Firebro houses in Manly as there were in Western suburbs at the time. It's a really interesting thing to watch. Um, if you get on YouTube and, and it's sixty minutes to a story on Roy and the yeah. West West Side, it's always the flip. Yeah, it's the the reverse of the story that was done on Four Corners, you know, the expose yeah. And, yeah. and Roy, he's sitting around how he would motivate the players, you know. It, it's it all unbelievable. Began, but Roy, Roy's brilliant at that. And it all began because before the 78 season, there's a documentary called Firebrows and Silvertails. Yep. I've got a DVD of it. It's, it's great to watch. Anyway, they, the NRL, well, New South Wales back then is looking to expand. So they want to put a trial of Western Manly on down in Melbourne. So 
being amateur hour back, back back then, they put them on the same plane and they get down to Melbourne. There's one bus to take both teams. So the Manly guys get there first and just – Basically, this is this is the the seed of who where this be, started. Who was the better team at the time, Manly? Uh, oh, Manly, Manly were the better yep. side. Yeah, yep. yeah. West were on the they way up. Edie and all these great, yeah. they had a great side. And seventy seven, they won the grand they were premiers. S- seventy eight, uh, seventy eight, seventy eight, seventy eight. The Just, replay again. So, sorry, yeah. yeah. So anyway, but so uh, this seventy eight season, they get they get there, they get on the bus because they just get off the plane first. They get on the bus, and they're sitting up the front of the bus, and Roy just sits there and says to his players, and you don't need much to fire up Tommy Rodonigas or, or Dallas Donnelly. He says, what about these bastards? I think they're too good for us. <laughs> Why is that, Roy? Mate, they've taken the front of the bus and making us sit up the back. Oh, you're right. That was it. That was it. And from that seed, Roy just fed it. Because you, as, as your team, you know, Finchie, you're always looking for something. Yeah. To be insulted. You're, you're looking to be motivated. You're looking for a reason to be insulted. Yeah. yeah. A, it, and that was it. That was the insult. They sat up the front of the bus and, and, and thought West were only good enough to sit up the back. And that's off it went. It's really uh, in, in that 60 Minutes um, story. They're sitting around. There's, there's a bit where Roy decides to go with the, with the team highbrow. Because the cameras are on him, Roy. Yeah. So I think it's no longer the same about Fibro. So he goes, he's up and he's got them all sitting around. They're sitting and it's like a it's like a school hall yeah. before the game. And he's sitting there and there's Bobby Cooper and there's Les and all those blokes. And he's going around. He's going, people of the western suburbs, you know who we're like? We're like the Israelites. <laughs> it starts to go into the history of the Israelites. You see Bobby Cooper in those places going, what's he talking about? Who the f- it's like when Alan Jones took over Balmain, he got up and told a speech and, and quoted Churchill. And the Prime Minister Churchill said this, and, and uh, one of the, the Tigers players said, When was Clive Churchill ever Prime Minister? <laughs> Unbelievable. Mate, there was one Warren, talking about Warren Ryan, he got up once and did a sport, uh, talk about the importance of footwork. And it was about, it was about like, you know, why you should wear long studs at night and things like that. He said, mate, you give me – because he came and saw me earlier and he said, Matty, what I want you to do is I'm going to ask a question to the playing group. Name me a sport where footwork isn't of the highest priority and I want you to come in and say billiards. I said, sweet. <laughs> so, he walk, so he walks <laughs> in and he goes, uh, righto, boys. A couple of boys slipped over last night in that game. One cost us badly, Tamana. Anyway, here's a question for you. Someone give me a sport where footwork isn't the highest priority. I said, I'll go on for you, Warren. Billiards. He went, you're a f- <laughs> <laughs> He said, let me just quote, he said, um, the great uh, Walter, Walter Lindrum. Lindrum. And he <laughs> went on this long talk about Walter Lindrum and his breaks and how he'd use his footwork with billiards and everything. And at the end of this long talk, he said, any questions? And Tamana Tohu said, what's billiards, Warren? <laughs> um, I'll tell you, memories I've got of the 70s. And my dad playing like my dad. My dad was funny. Um, he was a bit of a prodigy coming through at Curry Curry, mm. uh, and he was one of the youngest players to play first grade there. He ended up moving to the arch rival Cessnock, which, if you're up there in the coal fields, is mate. It's a big move. It's ten, you know, ten fifteen yeah. minutes away, but it's yeah, it's a big it's delight. A life, it's, yeah. It is it's a life and changer. He moved to Cessnock because they signed another lock forward from Sydney called Johnny Raper. Whoever yeah. he is. What, 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 what happened ever, to him? Whatever yeah. he, what did he ever do. <laughs> anyway, so the dad goes there. He had a couple of offers. He nearly went to Penrith, but said, nah. The Newcastle know. competition was really strong. It, it was really strong. Yeah. He enlisted signed with Penrith because what, dad's first ever game for Cessnock, they played Penrith in a trial game, right? And the old man squared off with Mike Stevenson, the great, the great yeah. Great Britain hooker, and they got into a fight that spilled into the grandstand. And Stevenson apparently said after the game, mate, sign that young bloke. Anyway, the old man said, mate, uh, mum was pregnant with me. Mate, I'm too young to move to Sydney. And then a little later, he was going to go to the Dragons, but did his ACL. And I remember, that I, I don't really remember Dad playing that well, but I remember in the late 70s watching him play and Dad had, had lost all his mobility because, I mean, you do an ACL then, it was retirement. Uh, yeah, you had scar mate, 12 inches long. When he ended up getting it done, redone really again, what they did, how, the, how they did his ACL back then, they just cut his, they cut his medial and lateral ligament, stretched him and pinned him to the other side. So he used to, even years later, you'd be walking, you'd be so working down the pit and he'd just collapse. And he just, yeah, he had no movement, couldn't run. But I remember my dad, like I'd run into people all the time, people would say how tough your dad was. And dad said, Matt, I used to be a skillful player. I had good footwork, he said, but that robbed me of that. Yeah. He said, so I was just angry. Mm. And I remember one day being at Lyle Peacock Field at, McQu- uh, Toronto. at Toronto 
and watching Dad play, I was about 1978, 79, and watching Dad play against Macquarie, and Dad getting sent off, sent off for this vicious elbow on this bloke. And as Dad's coming off the field, he's attacked by two women with umbrellas. <laughs> One of them was, was the wife of the bloke he knocked out. But, you know, I got my love of football from my old man. And, and, and up at Cessnock, I mean, in the town there, I reckon there were two institutions. There was Rugby League, the Cessnock Go Winners, mm. And uh, the Catholic Church in those days. And going to, I was taught by, in, I think it must have been about 1978, I got taught by a 70 year old nun called Sister Bede. Sister Bede was a rugby league fanatic. And she, when, when Dad would later go into Coach Cessnock, she'd always you know, call me up to the front of class, Matty, can I just have a talk to you about your homework? And we'd sit there for an hour and she'd talk about, you know, why is your dad picking that guy and shouldn't he put him? <laughs> and when Dad used to coach, she used to get up to the top of the convent and she used to be able to see Cessnock Sports Ground and she used to pray to St. Patrick for the Cessnock Go Winners. Wow. But that sort of, you know, things like that, you know, you, you don't yeah. get people like nah. that anymore, do you? Nah. No. And, and it's the 70s were the era, Matt, but I think when rugby league really began to – to grow as a sport, like it, it boomed in the eighties, mm. but the foundations were set. Did you have the twoies? I think. Did you have the twoies? Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, that was the. I don't know if that was early eighties. More KB, I think, yeah. in seventy. Yeah, but the, the the way that the Parramatta, they were the fairy tale, came through and and got on that that, that great side with Cronin and, and Price and, and Ray Higgs back way way back then, and and got going, and then you still had the greats. You know, Ronnie Cooper was still playing then, and you had this era. The game transitioned. It got used to. It went from the from unlimited in the sixties to four tackle rule for the. I think it was a sixty seven season, and then they quickly got into the six tackle, and that's when the game started to really challenge the as a as a as a in the conscience of the of the wider public, mm. and and that's that's what rugby league has always got to do, and always we should always be striving to yep. to reach those people who know enough about the game to sort of look over it, but don't want to go to a game, yeah. don't want to follow a yeah. team, and the rest of it. I remember um, sitting down in 1978 watching uh, Five Rose versus Silver Tales. It was West versus Manly at a friend's place. Because back in, if you lived in Cessnock, we didn't have we didn't have a big aerial. You know, you had those monumental aerials, yeah. aerials so you could pick up the the Sydney Channel. You used to send your dad up there and he'd sit yeah, there. How he he is this? It worked with a coat hanger. So we used to go over to um, the Edwards house and we'd just sit there. I remember watching, in my mind, the first time I'd ever seen. You know Rex Mossop's big league, yeah, and it come on the theme from Shaft, did it, yeah, dun 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 dun, and it lights a fire in you. I remember yeah. thinking, mate, this is magic. Mm. Oh, it's mm. just something special. The other thing is just how times change. We oftentimes though, these days we talk about you know what's the biggest threat to rugby league, and we talk about other sports. We talk about you know the AFL, you know um, so the world game and things like. That. The greatest threat I think to our sport is, mate, it's PlayStation, Xbox. Yeah, because you think about when you're growing up. Like my my weekends Foot. were just football. Yeah. yeah, we play in the backyard. We go to the Cessnock Town Hall. Yeah. We go to the Tech. All these different places where the local kids would meet and play football, mm. or play cricket during the summer. Well, yeah. Matt, the thing, that, yeah, you look at news, the newspaper industry but in the seventies, the sixties, all those those years, three sports sold your paper back then. Yeah, you, you had cricket, you had racing, you had rugby league. That was it. Mm. Whereas now you've got. You, it, it's everything times two because you've got the women's game as well, the women's version of whatever sport it is, but you've got all the other sports that need to be covered. And, yeah. and, and you know, I was watching the baseball the other day uh, earlier in the week um, and the, the Cubs were playing and they actually put an advertisement out there uh, to uh, don't retire. I think it's called – they've got some scheme called don't retire early or something like that, which is basically aimed at kids who are getting to 10, 12, 13 years old. Stop playing. And stop playing, playing sport. So they're trying to keep these kids in sport mm. because they're getting to an age where the PlayStation takes over. Yeah. They want to hang out with their mates. They don't want to go to organised sport any longer. So that's an American problem as well, but clearly it's a problem here. And you, you don't see kids playing. You ne I never drive past – I live at Lilyfield. You never drive past – the local oval and just see kids out out, out yeah, playing in the afternoon. Yeah. You'd be there till the old man would call you in the summer. Mate. Yeah, mate. street lights came on. Yeah, mate. all right, time to come in. Oh, in seventies, seventies, you're talking about pong. Yeah, you know, as far as video games, yeah, pong. Yeah, yeah. Pong, yeah. pong was from <laughs> was Nintendo it. or Atari. One yeah. of those. Look at how look at the video games now. Mm. Where we're going to be in another thirty years' time. Yeah. Well, James Graham's automatic robots will be actually playing the game and refereeing the game. There you go. There you go, boys. Uh, just back to Clubland. Um, Melbourne Storm versus Brisbane, Brisbane, that game last week. I was up at the game live. The Storm have a um, 
what they call a parents' weekend, Finch, you know? Yep. So one weekend they pick and they fly all the parents up, put the accommodation, parents all have dinner together and things like that. Um, before we talk about the game, a funny moment. Um, the Storm have one of their – they've got two welfare officers, Brian Phelan and a fella called Andrew Blowers. Now, people who know Rugby Union know Andrew Blowers is an all-black right. legend. Mm. And Andrew Blowers, how he became involved with the Melbourne Storm. Frank Panisi is a football manager. Frank, after being involved with Manly and the Kangaroos in the mid-'90s, he went and made went French rugby. He was on the coaching staff at the Springboks mm. during a World Cup and went and coached in, in, in England in the um, – in the Heineken yep. Premiership with Northampton. He got to know Andrew Blowers and invited him back. And, mate, he was such a great guy, Andrew, and said, mate, we've got a job for you at the Storm if you ever want one. So he does that. So a couple of weeks ago on our Sunday show, remember when Cameron Smith did his 400th game? Yeah. And the cut, there was Brandon Smith, the Bromwich boys, uh, Nelson, the Suffer Salt yep. Man. They were all in there doing the Harker, and Andrew's amongst them. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I went, and look, and, and for people who don't know, that's all black legend Andrew Flowers. Anyway, it's become a running joke amongst his man that I couldn't get his name right. So we arrive up there, and you're going for the, the team dinner with all the parents. And as he's going in, he's, Matty, how you going, mate? Andrew Flowers, you bastard. You know, chat, chat, chat. And he goes, oh, mate, look, all the parents are wearing stickers. Mate, I'll bang one on you and just put it on. Well, for nearly the whole the whole dinner, people were sort of double checking on me, and they were going, "Oh, mate, is Matt coming up?" And I'm going, "Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. you know," and, I, and I'm sort of letting it go. Going, "Oh, here, we, how f-ing embarrassing!" People think I'm f-ing Joey. We go to Suncorp Stadium. People are going, "Joey, how you going?" I end up going to the toilet in the second half, and as I'm washing my hands, look, he's put <laughs> Andrew Johns on there. <laughs> <laughs> what about the uh, watching that game live? It just shows you the difference. Between where the Storm are at yep. and where the Broncos are at, mm. it was a hard. They were, it was hardened professionals against a team yep. of young blokes t- trying to find their way. They left, I reckon, four tries out there as well. The Storm. Yeah, they did. Yeah, it could have been a lot worse. You know, one of the things that was really clear that I, I was sitting with, with my wife, and I said, "Mate, the Broncos are having a real dip here." When, when the Storm were leading 6-0, if, no, it was, if it was a long period in the game, it was 6-0, the Broncos were having a real dip. But when Melbourne scored again to make it 12-0, you could see the young Broncos, and we've all been there as young players when you're playing a great side. Suddenly, mate, you yeah, could see spirit. the eyes start rolling yeah. in the back it's of the head. It's a bridge too far. Yeah. And they're gone. Yeah. And what they, they start, you could see the way they played from that point on. It was like, mate, I hope this doesn't get to 60. Yeah. Yeah. It was self-preservation. Yeah. Jeez, mate, we've seen it before. They need a playmaker. They need, they, a lot need a, they need a leader so bad. Yeah. The, the, the X Factor too. They've always had an X Factor player. Alfie, Kevy, Pearl. Well, they've probably got that in their Lock, forwards you know, at the moment. Yeah. In, in, by Pangai is their X Factor. But <laughs> you're right, mate. They've got nobody to pull them together and say, guys, this is what you need to do to win. Yeah. They need that player, the, the James Graham player at, at St. George Illawarra now, who says, this is what we do. The, Imagine putting James Graham into that pack with all those young blokes. What yeah. it would teach them. Yeah, mm. they, and, and they need they do need somebody like that. And yeah. But the Broncos, I tell you what, it's interesting watching where they're at and how far their football has disintegrated this season. I, I expected a slow start because it's going to take a little bit of teething problems to get used to Seabold's version of footy and how he likes to play it against Bennett, who's a very simple coach, very simple principles in his game. Seabold's complicated, but they just haven't got there. And, in fact, they're actually going backwards now. And, Matt, you talk about getting a leader in and a playmaker. Mm. They're spending so much money in their cap just shoring up Yeah, the, the likes of yep, Lodge, Where's Pangai, Lodge, Haas, that, those guys. That's right. that, 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 there's no money there to get a quality player in. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna be a it's gonna be a slow build for the yeah. Broncos. The like, Jimmy Maloney conversation, like, yeah, why won't you get in for twelve months? Yeah, Jimmy, no. they, they'd be they they should have got him. Here's a question for you, right? Now. Cooper Cronk, mate, he's making a home. He's got a home now in in Sydney with with Tara, and he's happy. He's going to have an ongoing job with the Roosters, I dare say, with the mm. coaching staff. Cooper Cronk for one year. If it, like I me, mean, what would you pay Cooper Cronk to go there for twelve months? They wouldn't have the money in the cap. No. Mm. They'd, they'd have to release a okay. Imagine a they play. imagine they release a few. Imagine, I, I imagine, imagine if Cooper Cronk banged on the door of the Broncos and said, "So, if, you know, I want to return home for twelve months. You know, wouldn't mind living in Brisbane. One point six for twelve months. I, I don't think he'd do it. No, nah. no, no. But if he did, if you were Anthony Seabold, but is that just? Is that the band aid? 
Yeah. Well, yeah. it's what he can teach. I mean, sometimes we talk about circuit breakers. It's what, when you bring a person in. I'll give you an example. 2004, Melbourne, had, uh, Manly coming out of the Northern Eagles experiment, had some really lean years. Yeah. And Peter Sharp as a coach. Yeah. When Des first took over, they had some tough years. Des gets Ben Kennedy from Newcastle, yeah, brings yeah. him across. It was a great move for BK, even better for Manly. BK just changed the culture yeah. there. He taught all these young blokes. They had this talented young group, had the Watmo, uh, had, Watmo had the Stewart brothers, all these young guys coming in, but they didn't know how to win. And the, the boys tell the story about BK. He taught them how to train. Mm. Taught him how to do extras. Mm. But even he was great for Des because Des would come in after the game and go, right, oh, boys, there's our protein shakes and all that. And they reckon BK go, f*** Des. We're men. Bring the beers in. Yeah. Right, yeah. We'll try, we're going to train hard tomorrow. We'll yeah. train hard the day after that. Mate, we'll, we'll, we'll square the ledger. Let us enjoy a beer. And Des is like, okay, I get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, then, anyway, he left, didn't they? They won the – well, they made two premiers, well, two grand finals in a row. They, they won two – the, the year he retired in 2006, Six. BK, they made the grand final in 2007, lost to Melbourne, then belted Manly in 2008. Mm. So, One again in 2011. That's the sort of, you know, that's the sort of player that a, that a Brisbane needs, and, and there's no doubt. There's like, not a lot around, mate. Because, no, there's not. Know, like a good example is, you know. But, but they've always had so many players coming through up there in Brisbane. Every kid in Queensland always wanted to play for the Broncos. Yeah, yeah. He, but now everyone that's, wanted to play. That's one of the things. Me, Cameron, everyone wanted corporate. to play for the Broncos. Last week, Cameron Smith had in the Broncos. Mate, Cameron, the Broncos. Well, like you know, when you come through, he goes, "Mate, I went to all their home games, never missed a game." Broncos are both blessed and cursed right. with a massive catchment, which mm. makes it hard to go fishing to get you know get the right kids. You know, they, they identify kids at 15, 16, 17. Sometimes these kids, when they're 20, there's other blokes that they haven't had their eyes on. They just go through the roof. Yeah. They end up in Melbourne yeah. or end up at the Cowboys or end up at all these other clubs. And that, that was the case with Cameron. Well, not only Cameron. They missed Cameron, Billy and Cooper in the same, in the, in the same, at the same yearling sale, uh, essentially. Yeah. yeah, they did. And Cameron was saying some of his good mates were given Broncos – Scholarships yeah. and Broncos track suits, track suits yeah. and he said it used to just burn on me. Mm. That's why I asked him. Yeah. I said, "Is it a coincidence you always play your best football against Brisbane?" I was expecting him to go, "Oh no, Matty." Yeah. No. And he went, yeah. oh, no, it's not a coincidence." Save my best for. And he did it again the other yeah. night. Just the other Queensland side. Uh, well, the other two are going having a difficult. Cowboys are having a difficult season, but the Titans last week. Finchie, you were really strong after the game against the game of the Roosters. You just didn't think they... Yeah, I just see no no fight in them. No no fire, no... Justin Holbrook, he should, like, he'll be over there going, well, we know it's a massive job, but he's got to go in and do something first. Yeah. I, I, look, what does he do everyone first? plays bad. Jeez, I played... I was in a 15-year form slump. But I tried my ass off every week. Yeah. You know, you just don't see effort. You know, and, and I shouldn't say for all my, and it doesn't look like it hurts. He needs to get a player like you, uh, you look at players to change things around, Matt. I'll, I'll give you one. I'll go back to you know retro round. I'll go back to the seventies. Parramatta, perennial under underachievers. Yep. Couldn't bust an egg. They go out and they got Ray Price. Ray Price. Wow. Ray Price turned up in nineteen seventy six. Yep. Eels go to the grand final. Yep. They, that, admittedly, they lost. His first two years at Parramatta, 76, 77, grand final base years, but lost. But in his 11 seasons at Parramatta, all four premierships at Parramatta won, he played in, and three other grand finals. Seven, seven grand finals in 11 seasons what, at Parramatta. What happens when he walks out? Then he leaves the club. And, and let's remember, him and Mick Crane retired at the end of 86, but yep. they kept Kenny, they kept Sterling, they kept Della, they kept Growth, they, they kept Bugden, they kept Liebert, they kept Mosley, they kept Peter Wynn, they kept all those players. They brought in Bob Lynn to replace Ray Price. They brought, brought Mick Erickson to replace Cronin. Couldn't make the semis. What, in 87? 88, 89, 90, 91. Couldn't make the semis. The rest of Brett Kenny and Peter Sterling's career did not make the semis. Yep. Yeah. Malcolm really at Manly. Yeah. Never won Another a competition. One. They bring Malcolm over from Castleford, a pathological winner. They win 72-73. Yeah. I just think they need leaders up there at the Titans. You can have whatever coach you want. If you, mm. if the teammates aren't keeping each other accountable, yeah. and, you know it's fun. it doesn't matter who your can coach I, is. Can I make a point? It does not matter who your coach is. Finchie, and, you know, we, we've spoken about like our time at Newcastle when your dad was there. When they brought Malcolm really in as coach, they brought – Malcolm just didn't make Manly into winners. He did it with Newcastle because when he came in, like we were trying. Mm. Under David Waite and those previous, we were trying. And we thought 
we thought we'll give it everything we had. Yeah. So Malcolm arrives and he goes, right, what we're going to do, mate, fitness regime. For the for the first month, we just went straight to Broadmeadow Race Racetrack. Course. Remember that? Yeah. And he put us at the 1800 yeah. metre mark right. and it was a foot race to the finishing post where he would stand there in these dark sunglasses like Cool Hand Luke and just stand there with no expression, wouldn't talk to anyone mm. and just watch who was winning. And, mate, we were just – we were going as hard as I've ever trained. Two weeks after he arrives and two weeks after this training, the hardest training I've ever done, he writes a personal letter to all the first grade players and says, I feel like jumping on a plane back to Castleford. I thought I'd come – to a team that wanted to win. The way you guys train doesn't tell me you want to win. So the tra- everyone got together and went, is he f-ing serious? <laughs> Suddenly training went to the next level. and we Who, went who from- started that though? Who, who, st- what player said, you know what, maybe it's us? Yeah. After you got past that initial, yeah. is he serious? What player said, you know what guys, maybe it is us? It was probably Chief. Yeah. Joey and Chief were the yin yang. Yeah. When we go on pre, we go on pre-season camps, right? We do those. We had us on army camps, yeah, yeah. not as hard as the Melbourne Storm, mm. you know, anything like that, but enough to make us uncomfortable. And Joey is always going, "What yeah. the this got to do with football?" Yeah. And, and Chief would say, "Come on, yeah. let's just knuckle down." Yeah, yeah. But he'd still go on. Yeah. He'd have a whinge about it, and probably go, "Yeah, and go on, better than that than anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. But that's. And like, one, it's my nine point, straight, didn't you, to start the ninety-five? Yeah, we did, we did. Nine and and the, the point about it is, Finchie, is that. If you ask, like, they'll hear your comment saying, mate, for me, it doesn't look... Not, they'll go, no, no, we're out there trying. They think they're giving it all they've got. Yeah, yeah but... You know, they, they think yeah. they are. They just... Sometimes it takes someone to get there to squeeze, you know, what you're capable of out of you. But what you're looking for there, mate, I think it was Paul Crawley wrote a story after the game, and he compared the two halfbacks. You've got Ash Taylor coming back, both, both halfbacks on a million bucks. Yep. Ash Taylor, Cooper Cronk. Ash Taylor coming back into the side. Cooper Cronk... Not only scored his hundredth try, yeah. but he saved a try. He was his Not effort. Saved hundred. Yeah, and, and yep. Trent Robinson said that after the game. For every try he scored, he saved one. And his efforts off the ball, just efforts. Not I'm not talking about the class or the little the the the, the intellect yeah. side of it. I'm just yeah. talking about busting your ass yep. and going and, and and just supporting the mate, yep. supporting yep. your teammate. His efforts there were tremendous. The other bloke, who admittedly is coming back and trying to find it, but the first thing when you're trying to get your form back is you've got to address your effort. Yeah. And it's just not they, – they haven't been taught, yeah. the Titans, yeah, I know. about effort off the ball, well, yeah. about helping your well, teammate. Well, look, Cooper Cronk. The, the, the Cronk try. Yeah. You see the Cronk try? Yeah. The Cronk try where they did that. The they did, mate, on that, the Roosters did some mate, beautiful little synchronised pieces. Mm. The Him and Keery – Combinations, the greatest combinations are hitting their – you know they're hitting their peak when they can play these synchronised yeah. little plays at top speed and make it look like it's coming to nothing. Like, yeah. geez, that was – that's turned out well, but yeah. really it's, it's planned. It but there was one where he's gone – Cooper's gone, whoop, look one way, shot it back to the other side to Kiri. kiri has gone out and gone bang. Ash, on that play, went out at Cooper and then when Cooper threw it back went, oh. Done. Boom, caught him back on that inside ball. Yeah. You know, that's just those, that's exactly that, what we're talking about. Yeah, and that, that's it. And that's, yeah, you know, if you're Holbrook, you, you bring them back. Like my you, you, first thing he does, to me, just flogs them. Yeah. He I, just flogs them. And, I think yeah. the whole club has got it backwards. Cooper Cronk's earned probably his biggest paycheck in his last few years of his career. Yeah. After he's played Tests, Origins, won Grand Finals. Mm. There's blokes up there yeah. who've got big paychecks on what they yeah. potentially could do. Potential. Yeah, yeah, and, and but there's players that they've bought. And, and good luck to them. There's nothing wrong. You know, Finchie, but they've, they've, they've bought players up there thinking they've bought a leader, and players have gone up there mm-hmm. and just dropped back. Up. Well, some players, Matt, fall into the, the the character of their environment. Yeah, they do. Some players can, you know, again, we talked to James Graham. James Graham, I was talking to Paul McGregor yesterday, and he, he said, mate, you, see, you know what I love most about him? He said, if he doesn't agree with you, He'll sit and listen to your opinion, and if, if the, the chorus in the room is, uh, uh, yeah, we all think this, if he doesn't agree, he won't be influenced by that. He'll just say, no, I don't agree. He knows exactly who he is, mm. and that's why he's able to be a leader because he sits there and he can, he can cut through the bullshit. Mm. He can't be swayed by, okay, well, all the boys want to do this, so we're going to do that, right? Whereas some players want to be part of the group. How much is it yeah. just you're born a leader or you can develop leaders? I think you can develop leaders. I think there's some things that's innate in a person, Mason Lee, but I think some people can learn it. 
I think learning leadership from then on is a skill. Yeah. Mm. Like that is is a discipline too. Yeah. yeah you got to do it every day. Into your own ways You've got to have this certain characteristic every traits. Day. Chief once said to me, Chief, it's really interesting in talking about that, a little chiefism. We had a player who went really good for us at Newcastle in, in the mid-90s and we bought him from a club. Under Malcolm, he, he went really good. When the side was going, he was great. He got bought big money off to go to a Western Sydney club and uh, we're having a beer and Chief goes, shame he's leaving. I said, yeah. I said, mate, he, he's young, a young bloke, mate. He'll go good. And he goes, no, he won't. Hmm. I said, why is that? He said, environment's stronger than will and where he's going is yeah. shit environment. Yeah. And, and it's true. It's true. Nick Moratis just on might and power. I was talking to him once about the first time they got it out to do a bit of track work when it was mm. like mm. just sort of young, got it going. They had a hunch it's going to be something special. They put a young apprentice on it. They said, mate, just go for a bit of a run. The apprentice had it doing a run, mm. keeps running. And Nick's going, whoa, 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 pull it up. And he said, I can't. <laughs> I, can't. <laughs> I can't. I can't stop it. Hey, uh, boys, huge Sunday coming up. Yep. Looking forward to it. We've got a. Uh, Raiders versus the Roosters, which is going to make great, terrific game. Jeez, R- mate, Ricky will love yeah. coaching this one. Oh, yeah. Like, this, this is – Big crowd at home. Yeah. You know your, your certain coaches. Oftentimes you, you're coached by certain blokes. And when you're playing the bottom sides, they're really irritable. Mm. And when they're up – when you're playing against the teams at the top of the yeah. table, like, you see them – He'll have them up. Mm. Stick. Yeah. He'll have them up. And I think – It'll be all about no one's give us a chance. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been in the top four a year. Or, you know, yeah. no one's talking they about. They still us. doubt us. Um, you know, they're ready to kick. It's a siege mentality. He does it fantastic. You know, the players are happy down there. Mm. Respect to Josh Hodgson. They they love him playing under him. Yeah. He'll have them fired up. And South versus Melbourne, same day. Mm. Jesus yeah. be with, with Sam. With Sam. And, and the interesting against all odds. The interesting thing too is these these teams are probably <laughs> going to come against each other in the finals. Mate, what is so the, you're having a look at what. Mm. It's one of the great mm. rivalries, Bellamy versus Bennett, isn't it? Like, mm. the, I, I love the story. Like, the, those two have competed against each other uh, for 30-odd yeah. years now. They're, when Don Ferner brought Wayne to the Raiders in 87, there's a story that Wayne, as he did at Brisbane, wherever he goes, designs this hardcore yeah. you know, 9K, mm. 10K run, whatever mm. it is. And he did one at the Raiders. And they said that... Um, Bellyache wasn't taking part in the early ones. Bellyache had an Achilles problem or a calf problem or something. He couldn't train. Anyway, um, what he did, Wayne, as was for most of the part at the Broncos, Wayne would set the run and he would win the run every time. He used to practice for it. He used to practice. So. <laughs> so, and he said they do it every Saturday and every Saturday Wayne, Wayne would win. Yeah. But this day, this certain day, Wayne's running it and behind him you can hear this tap, 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 mm. tap, tap, tap sound he's never heard there's someone breathing down his neck and he turns around it's bellyache it's the first yeah. time he's run it and belly and the harder wayne ran the ha- the more bellyache just took off and went past him mm. and there's a question and then from there i mean they they formed a bond there he always had mm. great respect for bellyache he took bellyache to the broncos with him as a strength and conditioner his assistant coach gordon said that mate with the broncos play, play particularly bad wayne would just walk in the sheds and go Go on, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Craig will give him one of his famous sprays. And and that rivalry has continued. You know, he going to the Storm, yeah. those two have... And plus, the, the, the John Rebo set up the Storm. Chris Johns was down there. Yes. Had a, had a Brisbane influence. But Bellyache still trains as hard as you've ever seen. I remember me and Jimmy Maloney in 2009, we had to do an extra gym session a week. So me and Jimmy were weights partners. We walk in the gym. Bellyache's got the belt around him. He's about to do chin-ups. So he's doing weighted chin-ups. Yeah. It's like he's got about 40 kilos on this belt. He gets on the chin-ups, punches one out, right? And Jimmy's into him. Yeah, good on you, bellyache. Like, he turns around and goes, F- off, Jimmy. He goes, yeah, that's how many you did, bellyache. One. And he's just like, up again doing these weighted chin-ups. Mate, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. It's like, mate, what? I saw him one day in the treadmill there. Because that's one of the things that when you walk just to the running. Melbourne Storm headquarters, you always hear a treadmill going and it's bellyache just pumping yeah. it out on the treadmill. And one day he had, it was like, mate, he had a piece of foam under one of his feet about that. Thick, and I said to the physio, what's going on? Mm. She said, no, his, his physio, he, his Achilles is shot. He shouldn't be running. But I put that under there because he insists. That's what that's how he starts his day every week. Yeah. Unbelievable. Great Unbelievable. Uh, mate, uh, fellas, um, Callum Ponga, $6 million for four years. Um, that's what it, the, the management is after. Uh, Kenty, has there been any movement or word out of Newcastle where it's going to... No, there hasn't been any movement. I mean, they can't afford to not 
pick it up. They're pretty, yeah. They're, look, there'll be a negotiation, obviously, but it'll be close. If, I don't know if it'll be quite that high. That's Kalen's yeah, demand. It's okay. a lot in it. Well, it is Finch, but you know what? Yeah. A few years back, uh, another bloke signed a ten-year, ten million dollar contract at the Cowboys, yeah. and we all looked back and went, "What?" And yeah. but look it's at it good, now; it's good business now. It, it started oh, to look yeah, like yeah. A, a good buy, even when they bought Ponga. They bought Ponga, and they yeah. paid everybody at the time said, "Mate, you've paid it's way cheap, too much it? for a kid." A yeah. But you look now, and you think, "Gee, they got him cheap." Two so, year, well, eighteen months after that, it started to look dangerously low. Yeah, if you've got to play it too That's, much below his market, you're going, "Oh, mate, this kid might go." Yeah, you know? And let's remember, Matt, that the six. The, the two the, the six million over the four years is also a bit of a top up for the last couple of years of, yeah. of the current contract where they did get into yes in hindsight they got yeah, but, it was a great negotiation yeah. for Newcastle yeah but they took a punt at the time as oh well. they did they yeah. did and then, yeah, good and ideally you talk about the Titans ideally Finchy that's how it works when you sign a contract it looks like the player is getting too much money, and by the end of the contract, it looks like the club got him yeah. cheap. Good deal. That that's a good deal yeah. for both parties there. Whereas the poor old Titans, they're, they're paying, and and the, the Titans have. Mm. Um, I, I'm a, I remember too much. when Caitlin signed. I spoke to Bedsy and said, "Man, it's a lot of money." I said, "He goes, I spoke to him. He's a terrific kid." Mm. He said, "That's when he was sealed. When he spoke to Caitlin, he said it's worth it because he's character because he's a yeah. great kid. Mm. Yeah, he's work. He's got a great work. And, all, ethic. and, and mate, the he's fam- level-headed. And the, the fam- trick is and the keeper, though. He, and the he, family were all into. Yeah. That's what enticed Newcastle. Like on uh, the whole family, your father Andre. Yeah. They all said, mate, the whole family's moving. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're all in for yeah. the city. What other players? What are, What other players would you sign? Would you sign for your club for one point five million dollars? Let's forget about salary cap. Like, let's imagine that you got you got money to spend. Imagine you're the Bulldogs in twenty twenty two, and you're going right. We're after someone. I, Tom Travojevic, yeah. Tedesco, yeah. he's Tedesco. a superstar. Um, Cameron Munster, yep. Uh, well, here's one. I said it before with Cooper Cronk. What about? I asked Cameron Smith last week. You definitely play in 2020. Yes. If you feel good in 2020, would you go good. again? And he goes, mm. Yeah, I think I could. Would you sign a Cameron Smith if you were a Broncos or a Titans? Would you sign a Cameron Smith for 1.5 for one season? Just say, come and teach us how to win. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I still think, look, he's, he's still the most influential player yeah, in the game. I yeah, totally agree. And there, there is no indication physically mm. that he yeah. is diminished in, in any way. Yeah. So that that's the important part. You don't look at anything. Mate, he's still going well, but he wasn't what he was three years yeah. ago. And he's earning every cent from Monday to Sunday. Sure is. Every yeah. day. Don't think the storm will let him go, though. You wouldn't no. Know. But, but he, I'll tell you the other thing. Though. I got if, off at of 1.5. One year was just in Rupia. Yeah. <laughs> lira. Italian lira. <laughs> but the... Uh, the other thing is, whether history repeats here, Matt, Cameron Smith was going to leave and go to the Raiders, which he told you. 2003, yeah. Except then, was it Swain that ended Richie up leaving? Swain. R- R- he ended up leaving. Swain went to, went to Hull, yeah. Mm. What happens to Brandon Smith if Cameron continues to play? Well, what he... about young Harry Grant? Harry Grant. Harry Grant. Harry Grant. They, they, they are just loaded with young hookers there. Mm. So soon someone – see, this is where the, the Storm are going to have a problem. Soon someone going to say they can't afford to keep three of them. Mm. So let's just pick pick one here and, and have, a, have a dip. And uh, I tell you, there's a few clubs that will be desperate for a quality Donny Arf. Young Harry Grant mm. at the Sunshine Coast, he'll win the Queensland Cup Player of the Year by 20 points yeah. or something. Oh, really? That's rap- our dom. You're at a huge rap on him. I haven't oh. seen him play, but they, yeah. they, oh, speak, I, highly of his, they speak very highly of him in Melbourne. From a great family. Great family. Mum, his dad was an old player. His dad played rugby league in France, so they're a rugby league family. Yeah. Good family. Mate, he's a really de- down-to-earth kid. Yeah. He, he's got good acceleration. Um, he's skillful and he's tough. tough. Mm. Ticks it all. And he's, he's come through. He's had three years now in that Melbourne system. By the time he actually, you know, gets – yeah, you might. I reckon he'll get a taste before the end. Yeah, yeah I think they'll give him a bit of a go mm. in some way, shape, or form. But the other good thing about it is that they haven't Melbourne haven't blooded him at 19 years of age or 18 no. years of age. By the time he gets to first grade, he'll be ready. your old man used to say all the time, you know, because Newcastle was stockpile full of halves. He goes, "Don't worry about it. The longer it takes you to get there, the longer you'll, you'll be there. Yeah. You want to be get." Right up. Hyper, let's do our hypothetical of the week. Because two weeks ago. We did a hypothetical. How would the future pan out if Benny Elias kicked the field goal in the 89 grand final and the Tigers won? Of course, things like uh, Blocker would be the boss of Fox Sports, Benny, the president of Australia, uh, Ricky Stewart, Garbo and Queanbeyan, uh, Kevin Hardwick, who knows? Um, Oxford Scholar, who knows? He does pretty good for you. saw Kevin Hardwick around all the beaches, sir. Uh, but this week's hypothetical. 
In 2003, Craig Be Bellamy was interviewed for the Canberra Raiders job but missed out. What would have happened if Craig Bellamy had got the Raiders job? Uh, Josh Dugan would be the member for Queen Bianne. Mm. <laughs> well, you, you look at that. At the end of 2002, I was in the Canberra team at the time. We finished eighth. Yep. We get knocked out by the Warriors in the first week of the semis. Yeah. The Storm finish... Ninth, we yeah. beat them in the last round in 2002 they to finished, get eighth, eighth position. They finished tenth. Tenth, yeah. A manly finish ninth. Yes. So Canberra and yeah. Melbourne were at similar positions where their clubs were. 2003, they come fifth, then same sixth, again, sixth, yeah. and then yeah. away they go. Um, so clubs were both at a similar where yeah. position. I've already, I've had to think about this. Bellamy go, gets the Raiders job. Bellamy wins two comps with the Raiders. The Storm, meanwhile, keep Mark Murray for a few years till they bite the bullet and bring Wayne Bennett to the Storm. Bellamy, after success at Canberra, goes to the Dragons, wins a comp, then goes to South, which means this week in our hypothetical universe, Craig Bellamy's bunnies against Wayne Bennett's Storm. Melbourne Storm. The Storm win, and Craig uh, complains about the Storm's wrestling tactics. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Enjoy your week, boys. Too much wrestle. This has been a Fox Sports production.